Welcome, students, to the latest of our Chapter 6 discussion on the reactions of alkynes. <laughs> now, before beginning this lecture, I kind of want to tell you guys a story. Many years ago, one of my older brothers worked on an assembly line at a cookie factory. He was asked to train a recent hire and consequently took this new fellow to the factory floor and put him in the position that the supervisor had designated. My brother, having the responsibility to train this new employee, informed him that his job would be to just grab the cookies as they came off of the end of the assembly line, put them in a box, close the box, and then push the box into a stack of boxes where someone else would then organize and take care of them. My brother then supervised the man for a short while to ensure that he was doing all right, and then went back to his regular post. After about an hour or two, this new employee kind of snapped. While he was doing the monotonous labor that is typical of assembly line work, moving cookies into this box and pushing the box aside, he just got to the point where he freaked out and screamed at the top of his lungs, Why are you making me do this? And then he ran out of the factory screaming and never returned. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if that's actually funny, but dang it if I don't love that story. Now, I don't want you guys to feel that way when you're doing chemistry, but if you ever do, please take a break and be sure to come back afterwards. Following this lecture, you should be able to correctly draw the mechanisms and predict the products formed when alkynes are reacted under hydroboration oxidation conditions, alkynes are treated with H2, hydrogen gas, and a metal catalyst, you should also be able to explain why alkynes terminal protons are more acidic than alkenes, which are more acidic than alkanes, explain how to alkylate terminal alkynes, and design simple syntheses using alkynes. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. With our very first reaction, adding H2O to alkynes. Now before I vault into this, I want to first of all remind you of a reaction that we discussed in our previous chapter, talking about adding H2O to alkenes. I know you've seen this before, but I think the review would be beneficial. When we have an alkene, such as the one shown here, and we add water and a catalytic amount of acid, what ends up happening is we add hydrogen to the carbon that has more hydrogen stuck to it, and we add an OH to the internal carbon. Mechanistically, that occurs in this manner. I have pi electrons on this carbon-carbon double bond floating in the presence of catalytic acid. Those pi electrons come out and attack that proton. The proton now has a choice to bond with carbon 1 or carbon 2. Which one does it bond with? Remember, whichever carbon it doesn't bond to ends up getting a positive charge. Thus, the hydrogen ends up attaching to the carbon that has fewer carbons attached to it. That is carbon 2, giving us this intermediate. The reason is because it leaves me with the more stable carbocation at position 1, according to Markovnikov's rule. At this point, water, which is the solvent in this reaction, thrusts its electrons down into that hole, forming a bond with that positively charged carbon and giving me this intermediate. This oxygen is, of course, still in possession of a full octet. It's only positively charged because oxygen doesn't like having three bonds. When a second molecule of water comes in, electrons grab that hydrogen, push these electrons up into that positively charged oxygen to quench its charge, and gives me the final product. It also generates in the process hydronium, H3O+, which can serve as the source of H+, in the next catalytic cycle. Thus, we see that the OH always ends up going into the more substituted carbon, that is, the carbon that would give the more stable carbocation intermediate, which in examples like this is the internal carbon, while the hydrogen from the acid ends up going on the external carbon in the carbon-carbon double bond. So what happens if we add H2O and catalytic acid to an alkyne? Well, let's take a look. Here is an alkyne. Catalytic acid is floating in solution. And what's going to happen? Of course, the pi electrons are going to come out and attack it. Hydrogen has a choice. Does it bond with carbon 1 or carbon 2? Of course, we have to remember that whichever carbon it doesn't bond to ends up with the positive charge. The hydrogen, therefore, bonds to carbon 2, the carbon that has more hydrogens on it, according to Markovnikov's rule, because doing so leaves me with a positive charge at the more stable secondary carbon. At this point, we can imagine water coming in, thrusting lone pair electrons from the oxygen into that hole to give me this type of intermediate. As we saw with the alkene before, a second molecule of water can now use its electrons to grab that proton, push these electrons into the oxygen to quench that positive charge 
giving us this product along with hydronium to catalyze the next cycle. Now I want to point out something very, very important. This type of product right here is called an enol. The reason is because it has an alcohol and an alkene together in one molecule. We take the word alkene and the word alcohol and squish them together into one word. The word is enol. One thing that you should remember, in fact, as my students, I beg you to remember, is that enols like this, where the OH is coming directly off a carbon that is doubly bonded to another carbon, only exist transiently in solution. Why? Well, the reason is because these pi electrons will come out very, very quickly and grab the hydrogen stuck on the OH, forming a bond between this hydrogen and this carbon right here. Upon doing so, these electrons get thrust down here like a door swing on a hinge to form a carbon-oxygen double bond, giving me this product. This product is called a ketone. Thus, in reality, anytime we see a ketone or an enol, these two molecules are actually going back and forth to some extent, but they linger much more prevalently at the ketone position. And the reason is because a carbon-oxygen double bond is much more thermodynamically stable than a carbon-carbon double bond. Thus we see ketones isomerizing back and forth to enols with the enol form existing just transiently relative to the ketone form. This process of going back and forth is called keto-enol tautomerism. I want you to remember now. If I see an enol, that is an OH stuck to a carbon that's double bonded to another carbon, what I really have is a ketone. That will become extremely important momentarily. Before getting to that, however, I want to tell you something that I sort of lied about at the beginning of the slide. The real reaction conditions that are needed in order to push this reaction forward require a little bit more kick than just catalytic acid and water. In fact, if you take an alkyne a treat with catalytic acid and water, it will not proceed forward with this reaction as effectively as it will under these conditions. What we do is we take our alkyne, we add acid, and the acid we usually choose is H2SO4 with water, and we have to add mercury sulfate as a catalyst. It forms an enol, placing the OH at the more stable internal position. And then this enol instantly tautomerizes to form a ketone. So the real mechanism is a little bit more complex than the one that I showed on the previous slide. However, I showed you this re mechanism because I think it's easy to understand if we remember the analogous mechanism with alkenes. Pi electrons come out, hit the proton. Proton goes on the position that gives me the more stable internal carbocation. Water comes in, another water deprotonates, gives me the enol, and then the enol rearranges to form the ketone, according to this thing called keto-enol tautomerism. So to summarize, as we already discussed in an earlier chapter, if you take an internal alkyne, like the one shown here, treat it with aqueous acid and mercury sulfate, it will make a mixture of ketones with the carbon that was originally on the left side being double bonded to an oxygen in the product, and the carbon that was originally on the right side of the triple bond being also double bonded to an oxygen in the product. So we get these two separate products in mixture. In contrast, if you treat a terminal alkyne under the same conditions, it will generate only one single product, this methyl ketone. 